Well, good morning. It's a delight to uh, be here with you today. Uh, our mandate, as you heard, is to talk about the broader impact of metabolic drugs on related diseases. And as a cardiologist, I must say it's a rare chance that I walk into a conference and it's relegated to a related disease. So, but such is the impact of GLP-1s uh, on uh, cardiometabolic health. Um, we're looking forward to the discussion today. Um, and to kick things off, I'll turn to my co-moderator, Jason. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Jason Zemanski. I'm one of the biotech equity uh, analysts at B of A. I'm looking forward to a, a very interesting panel um, shared, uh, uh, sharing the stage with uh, not only uh, great uh, academicians and uh, prescribers, but uh, industry leaders as well. So I thought maybe we could start uh, with uh, each of the panelists introducing themselves. Uh, with the, the question of what do you think the biggest surprise of the GLP-1 class has been, and are we underestimating their potential? Greg? So I, I think that the, uh, perhaps the biggest surprise to me was the impact on cardiovascular disease that was independent of the weight loss, and that we see that there's huge impact of GLP-1 on cardiovascular risk reduction that's not necessarily mediated through the weight itself. And so that's a real problem for us to figure out, uh, a conundrum and a, perhaps the biggest surprise to me. Who are you? What's your name? Sorry, I guess I'm supposed to introduce myself as well. <laughs> I'm Craig Basson. I'm a cardiologist and geneticist, and I'm the chief medical officer at Bitterroot Bio. Uh, so Josh Cohen, I'm the co-CEO and co-founder at Amelix. Um, we're working on GLP-1 antagonists. Um, so the other side of the equation, primarily in diseases of hypoglycemia. And I think one of the biggest surprises to us, you know, as a company that's worked in neuro a good amount as well, has been seeing the, um, the neuro effects as well, you know, in terms of satiety, in terms of, um, you know, some of the emerging data on addiction and otherwise. Um, I think that's been, you know, not necessarily what was, what was expected as the GLP-1s began, um, you know, kind of greater, greater awareness. Thanks, Josh. My name is Panit Dillon. I'm uh, with a company called Sky Bioscience. Uh, we're working in metabolic diseases, including obesity, and uh, we're developing uh, GPCR-based uh, metabolic targets. Our initial target is in uh, CB1 inhibition, uh, and we're running a phase two study uh, that's also evaluating in combination with GLP-1. It's certainly been um, the unexpected uh, uh, kind of outcomes that we're seeing out of the GLP-1 uh, is uh, panelists have mentioned neurodegenerative diseases and, and uh, cardiovascular outcomes. I think we've been also exploring sleep apnea uh, in terms of that's another, you know, a, a large uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, I think there's still yet a lot to be still discovered. Uh, generally, uh, you know, weight uh, loss um, or obesity is linked to, uh, to inflammation and inflammation kind of being a, a key factor in a lot of different uh, diseases we'll, we'll still see. Uh, a lot more data to come from the GLP-1 class. That's great. Yeah, so Justin, uh, uh, Josh's fellow co-CEO, co-founder at Amlex. Uh, so I think for me, probably the data that's been the most uh, surprising, I have to say, is in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and that story is still emerging. But I think it highlights that uh, we've known for a long time the gut-brain access is very important. We know that Parkinson's often starts in the gut. Uh, but to see uh, molecules that are primarily used for uh, diseases or conditions of the periphery uh, be very effective in a clearly central nervous system uh, disease like Parkinson's, I think is very exciting. And it highlights that there's so much more to learn on the gut-brain axis, and I think that's going to lead to even uh, uh, more uh, uh, therapies for some of the really hardest diseases we have around today. Hi, uh, my name is Rohan Paleka. I am the CEO of 89 Bio. And we are focused on liver and cardiometabolic diseases. And our lead program is a FGF21 analog. So I'm one of the people on the stage not related with the GLP-1 class. And we're developing this for liver and cardiometabolic diseases in combination with GLP-1s. I think the most surprising for me has been the breadth of applications and indications where you're seeing some pretty profound data, right? And, you know, as some of my colleagues said on the, on the panel, like some of these diseases have been pretty hard to treat. 
and you're seeing some remarkable data with, without a direct targeted effect, right? Working through the periphery and yet making a difference. And so I think it opens up a whole new area of exploration and innovation. Well, thanks, Rohan, and thanks to all of our uh, panelists. Um, we have plenty of questions to keep us going, and I'm sure we can keep our own conversation going for the entire uh, morning. Um, we will kick things off with a few foundational questions, but we would also welcome uh, any uh, questions from the audience. Feel free to direct them through, uh, through to us on the app. Um, with that in mind, um, part of the mission today is to talk about the effects of the GL1P class of drugs outside of just weight loss. And for that, I think one of the foundational studies was the SELECT trial. Craig, I was hoping you could take us through that just as a refresher to remind our audience sure. what that was and uh, <clears throat> the impact of it. Sure, happy to, Patrick. So the SELECT trial was really a very exciting trial. It looked at 17,000 patients who were overweight to obese but did not have diabetes. The GLP-1s had already established foundational data with semaglutide that was being studied in, in SELECT in diabetes, that was well understood. But this was critical to study this effect of this drug in, these, in this population that was overweight to obese but had no diabetes. Um, this was a secondary prevention trial. So that's a trial of patients who had already had a prior cardiovascular event. Everybody had had a heart attack before, a stroke, or had active peripheral artery disease at the time that they were enrolled in the trial. And people were followed for about three years uh, and uh, with about three years of treatment. The results were very exciting. There was about a 20% reduction in a combined endpoint. The combined endpoint looked at uh, death from cardiovascular causes and other problems combined in this com one endpoint. Really a remarkable result to see that. Some limitations to that. If you looked at the individual components of the endpoints, such as cardiovascular death, you couldn't see a significant impact. But directionally, the cardiovascular death was, was reduced, as was other important cardiovascular endpoints that didn't reach significance, but were also uh, directionally improved, like heart failure. Those results are very exciting. The subsequent analyses of, of SELECT the sub-analyses were even more exciting. As I mentioned a moment ago, one of the really important observations was that it didn't matter what your weight actually was when you were enrolled in the trial or how much weight you lost in the trial. Even if you came in with a modest, modestly overweight and had very modest weight loss, you still benefited from the drug. So that was very, very intriguing to folks. At the same time, we didn't really understand why that was. And that remains an important question uh, for everybody to really tackle. If this is not mediated through weight loss, this improvement on cardiovascular, what is it that we're doing with GLP-1s to improve these cardiovascular endpoints? This is an area at, at our company, Bitterroot Bio, we're very interested in. As you heard already on the panel, people have invoked mechanism of inflammation. There are a variety of approaches that have, are that people are taking now that are anti-inflammatory approaches that follow in the footsteps of GLP-1 and before that, canakinumab to reduce inflammation and hopefully improve cardiovascular disease. At Bitter Bio, we're particularly interested in immunologic modifying agents to improve atherosclerosis, and particularly with a focus outside of these cytokine-dependent mechanisms, the soluble mechanism, actually target the cellular mechanisms in the plaque by targeting particularly macrophage populations for an ambition of CD47 to reduce plaque. These approaches all combine but synergize together, these cytokine inflammatory approaches, the cellular approaches, and the GLP-1s, we hope will make a durable impact. Because remember, although I said it was a 20% reduction in these combined endpoints, at the end of the day, the population that was treated still had a 6.5% mortality over the course of the trial. So there's a long way to go to really make a difference and really solve this problem for our patients. You know, it brings up a, a lot of interesting questions um, given the results of, of SELECT. So I, I want to open the question up to the developers here. But when you think about the GLP-1s, there's beyond the um, metabolic uh, changes, but, but behavioral is where, as well. So as we think about advancing um, your distinct programs, 
Um, do you think that there's going to be kind of fundamental changes on behavior and what can be done if not uh, to ensure that, you know, whatever therapy um, is administered, that there's, there's longer term benefits here? Behavior? Yeah. Um, you're in that interest. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. Um, so I, I do think there will be, you know, changes in behavior. I think it also comes in as we're designing these trials, um, you know, thinking carefully about how we um, manage behavior during the course of a trial as well. Um, you know, if people change their diet or change their behavior, that could either mask or accentuate, um, you know, the effect of a drug as well. Um, so I think that's something that we'll, you know, we'll certainly need to think a lot about. Um, we're thinking a lot about in our, you know, hypoglycemic populations where, of course, um, how people manage their diet and otherwise does have an impact. Um, you know, looking at the um, you know, post-bariatric population where we're focused as well, interestingly, there is a similar finding that people after bariatric surgery have this um, you know, reduction in, in cardiac outcomes that probably you know, is hard to explain by weight loss alone, um, which again, suggests exactly as you're saying, potentially some additional mechanisms, whether hormonal, inflammatory, et cetera, um, at play. Puneet, and then maybe Rohan? Yeah, yeah I think uh, yeah, I can elaborate. Like in, in terms of the class, uh, the class that's been dominant to date has been really centrally acting, uh, meaning it's been focused on this idea of caloric restriction. Uh, I think it's been evident that the, that the data is really showing that it's making a significant uh, difference for patients with obesity. Uh, However, I think what we're going to experience uh, next is, a, is, an, is another wave of more peripherally acting uh, approaches, and that's where uh, we're focused in terms of development strategy is uh, can we have a more uh, 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 optimized body composition uh, that's focusing on lean mass preservation, that's avoiding some of the side effects and GI uh, tolerability issues that the current class has uh, shown. Uh, and uh, address the subtypes uh, in these metabolic conditions that go beyond just looking at weight loss. There's uh, other metabolic gains that are very critical uh, that, that relate to these other diseases that I think that are important. So the peripheral mechanism uh, in terms of having a, a, a more productive uh, body composition, I think, is, uh, is an idea uh, that will probably become more prevalent in the, next, uh, in the next year. Certainly this year has been dominated by a lot of headlines on the GLP-1 class because that's what's available. The current uh, proof therapies are, are fall into that, that camp. Um, the majority of the pipeline is focused on that. But in terms of when you look at the non-incretin-based uh, 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 drugs, uh, there's, there's only a handful there in terms of mechanisms. And, uh, and most of those are focused in the periphery. So Jason, when you think about many of these disease states uh, which we are focused on, it's a multitude of different factors which play in, right? And therapeutic intervention by itself is not the only solution. You do need the behavioral changes because otherwise you're going to continue to have additional insult and injury and then you're trying to solve it all with the therapeutics, right? So it's a combination of both which becomes critical. So we are in late stage development for NASH. And when you think about the liver, the downstream effects of metabolic dysregulation on the liver, you can address what's happening in the metabolic dysregulation, but it's equally important to think about what you're doing to address the fibrosis component of the liver. And if it was purely behavioral, it's going to take a long time to do it. So even with bariatric surgery, uh, it takes about greater than five years to see a benefit on fibrosis in the liver. It's a long time period despite bariatric surgery. So you've got to think about it in two constructs. And so behavioral changes are critical because if we don't address that as a society, you're just going to continue to have challenges and the incidence of all these cardiometabolic disorders continue to grow. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just add one thing to that, that we, you heard several times now that on this panel already about the impact of the synergy between 
behavioral modification with the medicines. Let's acknowledge that whether they're peripherally or centrally acting, if you're targeting GLP-1s, you're targeting that gut-brain axis. And yeah. so there are impacts of the medicines themselves on, on neurologic processes. As a cardiologist, I'm always impressed by the complexity of neurology and don't begin to understand that. Um, I think that we do have to be careful as we manipulate those processes, both through behavioral modification as well as pharmacologic modifications. What are the un unanticipated adverse consequences of that? You already saw noise, which seems not to be statistically significant, but suicidality with GLP-1s. Let's harken back in the obesity space to Ramona Band, which was a fairly effective drug, but was associated with suicidality. So I think this is just something we need to keep on horizon as we m manipulate behavior, both with therapeutic approaches, lifestyle changes, as well as uh, medicines. What is the impact of behavior on the rest of our quality of life? Thanks, Craig. I mean, while we're on that theme, do you think there are other unknowns that we ought to be aware of? I mean, outside of just the behavioral ones, are there other things that you're concerned about at the moment? So, again, as we, as already been mentioned, for the GLP ones, there's obviously the, the gastrointestinal side effects. There sure. was, in select, a, a small increase in, in cholestatic uh, disorders afterwards that one has to be aware of. And certainly, as we target other agents, FGF21, FGF19, there have been issues and concerns around the GI axis, but we do expect that there are an impact uh, more broadly on inflammation, fibrosis, immunologic pro uh, processes, and those are systemic issues that have both good and deleterious impact on us as we confront pathogens, as we confront other areas. So I think it's a balance that we need to watch very closely, I know all of us do in all of our clinical programs, monitoring adverse effects as carefully as we monitor the efficacy of, of agents. Yeah, and I might Great. just add there too, um, I think one interesting thing that will keep emerging is the personalization of this as well. Um, when we look at um, GLP-1 agonists, for example, um, the amount of weight loss is not equal for all people. Some people lose more weight, some people lose less weight, and continuing to understand, is that behavioral? Is that genetic? Could there be certain um, you know, genetic uh, variants or otherwise that cause somebody to be more responsive or less responsive um, to these therapies. And I think similarly on the, on the safety side, I'm sure we will find as more and more people are exposed that, you know, different variables may lead to somebody having, you know, more or less, you know, potential deleterious responses as well. But I think that's, it goes to the whole point of having multiple mechanisms and continuing to grow this space so that we're giving the right therapy to the, you know, to the right patient. And bu building on that a bit, I think um, that's why I think all of us on the panel sounded like the prior panel as well, um, really feel like we're just at the start of a revolution in uh, metabolic disease. Uh, and I think uh, my view at least is that um, the reason we're at the start is because we're, we're really in many ways just starting to study these processes clinically. Uh, so all of us do a lot of work preclinically to understand the profile of the different agents that we're working on. But there are certain things that you really can't understand until you get into people, oftentimes into very large studies. Uh, I think as, as Craig was saying, for example, the results of the SELECT study were, were you know, I think remarkable, but also uh, in many ways brought up even more questions. And now we can have further studies to, uh, to address those and, and start to look at uh, different pathways, as Josh was saying, uh, the right treatment for the right patient. Uh, so I think as we continue to see these uh, really powerful studies, we're going to get to a point where we understand the pathways even better and we can continue to refine our treatment approaches. Yeah, I uh, just want to expand on, on one of those aspects there. I think there's certainly been uh, uh, an opportunity here where the subtypes of obesity can, can really be addressed with uh, pharmacotherapy. So it's, to date, you know, there's only seven different drugs approved. Um, so if we follow kind of the path uh, here in terms of what we learn from other therapeutic areas, combinations uh, do open up a lot of opportunities to address those, those uh, different subtypes uh, and those mechanisms uh, kind of working in, 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 in a complementary or synergistic way to add to the degree of weight loss. Uh, you talked about kind of the side effects of, of GLP-1. I think those are still, we're still, uh, you know, waiting on a, long, a larger subset of data to uh, see if there's any um, uh, uh, you know, serious uh, negative uh, side effects. But the, 
uh, one aspect is the discontinuation aspect of GLP-1. And if we, if we think about pharmacotherapy and metabolic diseases uh, and you relate it to diabetes or hypertension, the objective is, is, to, is to have the lifestyle changes to be complementary to pharmacotherapy in order to have that long-term effect. So I think that that is still p pending in terms of really seeing what the long-term effect is. And, and that's where we've been focusing our development strategy is that it may not be necessary to have these large double-digit weight loss numbers uh, for the entire population. Uh, if you look at the overweight in class one, that's, a, that's the larger segment of the population versus the class three and class four. Uh, so to some degree, you know, having a 5% or 10% weight loss is gonna check off a lot of metabolic gains and be preventative uh, towards other comorbidities. Uh, so we think that that's still yet to be uh, explored further with the, all of the, the work that's happening in pharmacotherapy development. Um, maybe let's shift gears a, a little bit and, and before we start uh, uh, opening up the, the floor to the, the audience here, but just to get a sense of, of for the uh, developers especially, kind of what you're focused on and, and maybe to start at the opposite end this time, Rohan, you know, you're focused on, on MASH. Where do you think GLP-1s play there, you know, especially given that, that some glutide failed in the, the indication and, you know, especially given how complex MASH is, is is this a disease or an indication that you can get by with a monotherapy? Uh, thanks, Jason. So if you think about NASH, while it's a liver disease, at its core, it's a metabolic dysregulation in these patients. But it's a disease which progresses over a really long time period, right? And it can be 15, 20, 25 years. And if you think about how the patient progresses through that time period. In the early course of the disease, uh, really the risk profile of that patient is now very significant. And what I mean about the risk is the risk of your fibrosis progressing, because that's what the clinician is concerned about. As you get later into like a fibrosis stage three, you're really you're concerned about the risk of going into cirrhosis, because once you go down into cirrhosis, that becomes highly problematic. And once you're cirrhotic, and there are over a million four patients who are cirrhotic today, it's all about the risk of having a decompensation event. So if you think about that treatment paradigm, Chisin, in the early stages where your risk profile is lower, it's all about resolving steatohepatitis, because someone can stay in that stage for 10 or 15 years and never progress. And in that stage, a really potent metabolic, anti-diabetic, or an obesity drug could be really good when combined with diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. However, when you progress further, and now you're in advanced fibrosis, you really need something which is a potent antifibrotic. And as you mentioned, meaning semaglutide did a study in that patient population and did not see a difference versus placebo. Now, terzetipide showed a slight difference. Uh, but it's not really curing the disease of patients who are in advanced fibrosis. And semaglutide also did a study in cirrhotic patients where they did not see a benefit. And so the agent we are developing, uh, which is the FGF21 analog, showed really profound changes in these advanced fibrotics and in the cirrhotic patient population where we are able to reverse fibrosis. So if you think about the treatment paradigm, we absolutely believe that GLP-1s have a very important place to play in this disease state. But you, as these patients progress, which is the more problematic patients to treat, you're probably going to have some kind of polypharmacy requiring additional agents beyond just a GLP-1 and diet and lifestyle changes. So that's kind of the treatment paradigm as we see it evolving. And then uh, Justin and Josh, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your approach to the development of the GLP-1 receptor antagonists and how you're thinking about moving forward, particularly given the cardiovascular uh, implications? Sh sure. Um, so, you know, the primary disease or primary condition we're focused on is, you know, a subset of people after bariatric surgery can develop um, hypoglycemic episodes and events. And one of the things that's been associated with that in the literature 
is people having GLP-1 levels as high as 10 times normal. Um, so we're developing a GLP-1 antagonist in these, disease, in these conditions where GLP-1 has kind of gone too far in a particular direction to try to antagonize it and bring it back closer to homeostasis. And you know, so we, we've not seen any deleterious effects of that, again, which may, maybe is not surprising as we're trying to bring it back um, to its normal set point. We're not trying to you know, knock it down um, you know, below normal. But what you do see is if GLP-1 gets very high, and there were some findings of this originally, the GLP-1s when they were combined with metformin and otherwise, if GLP-1 gets overactive, it can push the insulin response so far that you get into a hypoglycemic. Um, area. So those are the kind of diseases we're focused on, where it's kind of gone too far, and now you want to bring it back to get back to euglycemia. Yeah, and get, getting to the uh, pharmacology, uh, we think this is so exciting. I think one of the um, reasons that the GLP-1 agonists are so powerful is because uh, GLP-1 is one of the master regulators of the insulin glucose response. And uh, our, our bodies, it's our primary energy source. And so our bodies are constantly adjusting uh, to make sure that we have uh, adequate uh, energy usage and storage. Uh, now, like uh, probably anything in, in medicine, um, too much is not good and too little is, is not good either. And so uh, there are a whole series of diseases uh, characterized by uh, too much insulin or too great of an insulin response and therefore not enough uh, glucose. Uh, for those who uh, are familiar with uh, hypoglycemia, uh, hypoglycemia can be very dangerous. Uh, and the reason is because uh, our brains are the highest glucose utilizers in the body. So when our bodies don't have enough glucose, really our brains don't function the way that they're supposed to. Um, probably all of us have some familiarity with this, you know, that, quote unquote being hangry, or, uh, uh, or uh, you know, being in a meeting where you're trying to focus, but it's lunchtime and you can't quite focus the way that you'd like to. But for people where this is really off balance, uh, the uh, nervous system consequences are quite significant, uh, going all the way to loss of consciousness or even seizures. Uh, so uh, as uh, Josh was saying, there are a whole uh, a series of diseases and conditions where this insulin glucose response, there's, there's uh, too strong uh, of an insulin response and the glucose nadir is too low. And so people are in a perpetual cycle of hypoglycemia. It's very scary and very debilitating. Uh, so uh, having a GLP-1 antagonist uh, is great because it helps get that set point uh, back to uh, where it should be so that uh, people can, uh, can, can uh, lead the, the lives that they want to. So again, it goes back to, I think, some of the themes that are emerging from, uh, from the panel here, which is um, the right medicine for the right patient, uh, as well as, I think, the fact that we're just at the start of this revolution in metabolic diseases. Got it. And then, oh. maybe, Puneet, um, let's uh, flip the question around. What, what keeps you up at night as you, uh, as you think about you know, your development uh, path forward? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, kind of loaded question, especially what's happened in the last uh, four days. Uh, there's a, um, so in, as, as a, a Craig, um, sorry, uh, was outlining, uh, in the area that we're working on, uh, in, interestingly, it's, it's been a validated target for weight loss. Uh, it uh, was being pursued uh, by a lot of large pharma. Uh, Sanofi had a drug that was approved in the late 2000s uh, that uh, showed uh, about 8 to 10% weight loss at 52 weeks, had a, a drug approved in Europe, uh, and it got pulled uh, in Europe after the FDA um, didn't uh, approve the drug uh, based on these SAEs of depression and uh, suicide ideation. Uh, that was because that drug was really targeting CB1 inhibition in the brain, so centrally mediated, uh, again, focused on kind of the same caloric restriction type of equation. The um, uh, this, this this progress uh, in the last 15 years has been towards these second generation CB1 inhibitors that are focused in the periphery. And uh, we are working on a unique uh, mechanism that's an antibody. Uh, it's a large molecule, so it's very peripherally restricted. And just yesterday, we, we shared our PK data highlighting uh, how uh, exquisitely peripheral uh, that restriction is relative to the small molecules. Uh, last Friday, however, um, um, Novo 
uh, uh, shared their early data from their phase two um, at a top line, uh, highlighting about 6% uh, weight loss at, at uh, 16 weeks. So in fact, it's actually competitive uh, to, to GLP-1 class uh, at the time point. Uh, however, they did have a uh, neuropsychiatric um, adverse event. So no SAEs, but, but did highlight that they, they haven't been able to shake off uh, the, this concern. And uh, they've also highlighted that it was a dose-dependent kind of uh, response as well. So for us, uh, you know, that's, that's very square into, in terms of our development strategy. Uh, we've been interested in progressing our antibody in obesity based on the aspect that we've actually shown zero uh, neuropsychiatric adverse events in our phase one, and we're interested in kind of replicating that in a more robust phase two, where we're, where we're evaluating uh, this uh, current uh, uh, drug uh, in, a, in an obesity um, uh, trial design as a monotherapy, but as well as in combination with GLP-1. So we want to be able to highlight the additive benefit, but also be able to de demonstrate that you have a more productive body composition uh, and a better GI tolerability uh, in, in the combination as well as in the monotherapy. So that uh, is, is what's keeping me up at night. Uh, but uh, it's been, it's been um, a really exciting time, I think, in terms of this therapeutic area. And as uh, the fellow, fellow panelists have indicated, there's, there's a tremendous kind of opportunity here uh, in terms of where we're headed in terms of that large market size we, we hear about in obesity, but also the associated comorbidities. So for us, we, we are really interested in exploring uh, some of the things that Rohan uh, mentioned here in terms of demonstrating the anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic uh, mechanisms that, we, that we're focused on because CB1 is very prevalent in, in all uh, organs and, and um, in the case uh, that we're developing right now uh, in the adipose tissue. And Craig? So uh, I, I come back to your question before about combination therapy. We're, yeah. At Bitterroot Bio, we're focused on coronary artery disease in our lead programs. And we do believe that you're going to need eventually a, a belt and suspenders kind of approach to tackling coronary artery disease. In many ways, the approaches we're talking about here deal with the matches that light the flame of, 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 of coronary artery disease. These are inflammatory signals, whether they come from cholesterol, whether they come from adipokines. And if you, again, if you look at any of the trials that have tackled these problems, there's a huge residual risk in these programs. And that's probably because no matter how hard you try, no matter how many medications you take, no matter how you change your behavior in our world, it's probably very hard to avoid all of these matches and these inflammatory signals. The challenge in the plaque, in the atherosclerotic plaque and the coronary artery disease, is that once you encounter a match and light that flame, you start an autocrine loop, a, a feedback loop within the plaque that where inflammation and, and, and expansion of the plaque just builds on top of itself and just feeds back on itself in almost independent of the other matches. And so you have to tackle, as well as the inflammatory matches, you have to tackle what's going on in the plaque. Our approach is to do that, right? As, as that plaque builds and you build a necrotic de debris that's creating its own inflammatory signals, you have to clean that up. Just the way you might think about if you have, for all of you who've ever had that wisdom tooth that needed to be pulled, you had to get rid of the abscess too, right? You have to get rid of that debris. And so our approach is to activate those macrophages that are already in the plaque that are actually turn out to be inhibited by the inflammatory signals that are building up in the plaque. They express, they, those, this debris cells in the plaque turn out to express a don't eat me signal called CD47 that's been well studied in oncology. Um, and that inhibits the plaque from being cleaned up by the macrophages. So we can inhibit that signal and already see huge effects on the plaque. And that combined, the regression of that plaque, the, the inhibition of growth of the plaque can combine with those matches produce a more durable solution for patients. CD47 has had some challenges in the oncology space, there's no doubt about it, but like many other drugs where we brought oncology kind of invented drugs into the cardiovascular space, we've learned we can reformulate them, go at much lower doses, micro doses, and we can really do this very safely and we believe we can do the same. 
And so our approach is to combine these kinds of plaque cellular directed approaches to clean up the plaque along with inhibiting uh, the, the inflammatory matches, again, as a solution for, for atherosclerosis. You know, one comment I was going to make, you brought up, Craig, is despite a lot of therapies we have in the cardiovascular space uh, or in the liver space, there's yet residual cardiovascular risk, you know. And like our second program is in severe hypertriglyceridemia, where there are approved drugs and high-intensity statins do show benefit, but yet you have a very significant number of these patients who are unable to bring their trigs below 500. And so we have a phase three program where we're going to be studying it on top of high intensity statins, fibrates, or fish oils. Because these patients yet are at a high risk. And by showing really nice changes, we show decreases on ApoB as well as non HDL cholesterol, we can address that risk. And this is where I think combination therapies could really make a dramatic benefit or dramatic impact on outcomes at the end of the day for these patients. You know, I, th I think your points about triglycerides are real important. Also highlights the complexity, yeah. right, of, of this area and this issue. Same issue with the GLP ones about us not understanding well the mechanisms that are underlying this. You look at the synthetic fish oil approaches that have been effective in driving down cardiovascular risk, but again, their impact seems to be independent of their triglyceride so, so, lowering, exactly. right? Even though they started out as a hypertriglyceride therapy. So again, I think we have a lot to learn here. And, and as, as someone said, you know, I think we're really at the start of, of this journey. Yeah, I think we touched on a number of interesting themes. Uh, obviously, the, the concept of residual risk, that uh, patients, despite cholesterol reduction, despite weight loss, cardiovascular disease is still the leading killer. So there's a huge residual risk, and most patients are dying on therapies uh, these days. Um, uh, well, the cardiologist in me uh, can't, uh, can't uh, <clears throat> hold off on asking Justin and Josh, you're antagonizing the GLP-1 receptor. In light of the SELECT trial, how are you de-risking those cardiovascular endpoints? So we just have a second to address it. Yeah, so we're not, um you know, causing the GLP-1 receptor to act in reverse, um, where it's a competitive antagonist. So it's, you know, competing with GLP-1 for the, um, for occupancy of the receptor. Um, and again, we're studying this in indications where GLP-1 is at, at baseline very, very high. Um, so I'll say, to be honest, our data is probably the strongest element here. Um, it's been in over a thousand patients and we haven't seen cardiovascular risk, nor have we seen it in any of the um, animal studies that were done bringing the, the drug to clinic. Um, so it does not seem that we're having that, that impact. Yeah, I'd say Great. it's probably back to, back to the theme of the, the right drug for the right patient. So for example, if you have a patient who has, uh, as Josh was saying, up to tenfold higher GLP-1 levels, or in another condition, congenital hyperinsulinism, uh, people have a mutation that causes excess insulin secretion, uh, then you want something that can counter that. So uh, that's why we think that uh, if this is a sort of a thermostat, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work on one side, and now we're excited to uh, test on the other side as well. Well, thanks very much. I think we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much to our panelists for a great discussion today. Thank you. Thank you.